Greetings from the south suburbs of Chicago. We are Calvary Baptist Church of Glenwood, Illinois, the church of love. God's people say amen. amen. You know, in reading the Bible, we often try to imagine what the heavenly host may have sounded like. But now, as of this moment, we no longer have to imagine. We know how the heavenly host sounds. Um, in your hearing this morning, there is a word from the Lord taken from the 20th verse of 1 Samuel chapter 26. I shall simply be reading one verse. A verse 20, taken from the 26th chapter of 1 Samuel. Amen. I shall be reading from the New Revised Standard Version. Verse 20 reads, Now therefore do not let my blood fall to the ground, away from the presence of the Lord, for the king of Israel has come out to seek a single flea, like one who hunts a partridge in the mountains. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. All right. Amen. The king of Israel has come out to seek a single flea, like one who hunts a partridge in the mountains. I want to take for a title this morning, The Flea and the Partridge. Yes, right now. But just because I'm preaching one sermon doesn't mean it only has to have one title. So we're going to give it a second title, too. The second title is this, When Evil Gets Desperate. When Evil Gets Desperate. Before we preach, let us pray. Most merciful God, may this verse from this chapter of this book of your Bible be applied fully to our hearts, our minds, and our souls, and our walk, and our words, and our deeds. And Lord, I pray that you hide your servant, Jerry Michael Grimes the second behind the cross, that as I proclaim this gospel and your good news, the world may see less and less of me, and more and more of thee. This we ask in the righteous name, and the salvific, perfect, and magnificent name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And may all of the beloved people of God say, Amen. Amen. I may be the only one who's heard this song, but there's a song that I'm used to hearing from time to time, and the lyrics go, give, 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 give it in Jesus' name. Give, 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 give it in Jesus' name. Give, 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 give it in Jesus' name, and the Lord will give it back to you. I guess we just sing that in North Carolina then. <laughs> <laughs> but that's what the song says if you give it in Jesus name the Lord will give it back to you uh, the song says that the song does not say if you give to people people will give back to you what you gave to them um, the song in fact if it had to be rewritten the song might say if you give good, you might get evil back from people. Uh, the song might say that if you give people a slice of heaven, they might give you a walk through hell. Um, the song might say that if you give something to people, you may get nothing in return. But if you give in Jesus' name, then the Lord will give it back to you. I say this unashamedly um, as someone who has wrestled with the realities of life. Um, God's word in the book of Ecclesiastes is very clear that to increase in knowledge is to increase in sorrow. That's right. And much wisdom is much vexation. Mm -hmm. What that means is the more you learn, the more you will hurt. There's nothing wrong with being joyous, but some people are happy because they don't know any better. <laughs> because if they really knew what surrounded them, they could not be fully happy. They could have joy, but they could not have happiness. It is said that the moment that candidate Obama became President Obama was the moment that he went into the Situation Room. 
And they said the smile, the joyous, optimistic smile he had as a candidate went away mm -hmm. because he realized, as he was told by the NSA director, Mr. President, we live in a constellation of terror. Yeah. All 320 million citizens of the United States are constantly threatened by the prospect of terror. Everyone is in danger all of the time. Everyone on every train, every plane, everyone in every shopping mall, every single American is in danger 24 hours a day. We live in a constellation of terror. And Mr. President, in order for you to keep the nation safe, you will have to call for drone strikes, you will have to send special ops, you will have to send operatives 24 hours a day to keep this nation safe. And it's said at that moment that he stopped being a candidate. And the optimistic smile and the ideas of hope and change gave over to the reality that he might have to call for drone strikes and preemptively eliminate entire communities where there may be one threat. You see, it's easy to be happy when you don't know what's threatening you. But once you know of the danger around you, you can't smile the same way. Even your best day comes with a certain gray cloud because you know that you live in a constellation of evil. You see, the world is evil. We're surrounded by evil. We live in a constellation of evil. This world and everything in it belongs to the Lord, but Satan made very clear to Jesus, all the kingdoms of the world have been given to me, and I can give them to whomever I choose. In the end, the Lord will take them back, but they're temporarily on loan to the enemy. The world is evil. Every human being on earth is only 72 hours away from their true self. Every human being on earth is 72 hours away from finding out what they really are. All right. We think we're civilized. We think as human beings that we're not depraved. We're born in sin, born in it, born evil. If not for God, and even with God in our lives, we are still predisposed to what's called total depravity. We're evil. It only takes 72 hours to find out. 72 hours of no electricity. 72 hours of no running water. 72 hours of all the shelves being empty in a grocery store. 72 hours of no heat in the winter. 72 hours of no vehicle and no shelter. And in 72 hours, you will find out what a human being really is. There have been social experiments such as the Stanford experiment that proved if you take honor roll students and you put them in a prison population for two weeks, they will commit crimes. Most people get blamed for the way they behave as if it's them. It's not them. It's the condition. We live in an evil world. So the question is, how on God's green earth will we be good people in an evil world. How do we live a good life in a satanic world? How do we have good thoughts in a demonic world? How can we be good people in a rotten, wicked world? There's three things we can do. And we find all of them in this one little verse in 1 Samuel 26. Three things we can do. David does all three, and we can copy all three. Mm -hmm. David is not perfect, but he's a human being who's capable of being copied. First thing is, you must keep distance between you and evil. If you know something is evil, stay away from it. If you think something is evil, stay away from it. If it sounds evil, stay away from it. If you think it might be evil, stay away from it. If a certain corner looks evil, stay off of that corner. If a certain group looks evil, stay away from that group. If something sounds evil, remotely evil, stay away from evil. That's the first thing. Second thing is we must burrow ourselves like a flea. You see, the reason fleas are hard to kill is because one flea will burrow itself inside of something. You have to find a good thing and burrow yourself inside of it. So you have to keep a distance from evil, but then find a good thing and burrow yourself inside of it. 
Third thing you do, you must hide yourself behind a partridge. Hmm. What are you talking about, preacher? What do you mean a partridge? You must hide yourself behind something that's stronger than you. You must hide yourself behind somebody stronger than you. You must hide yourself underneath something that is stronger than you. That's how you live a good life in an evil world. Stay away from evil. Burrow yourself into something good. Hide yourself beside, behind something and someone stronger than you. That's how you live a good life in an evil world. If you want to know how is it that some people are good and others are given over to evil, good people will find a way that they will separate themselves from evil. Good people will find a way to burrow themselves inside of something that's good. Good people will find a way to hide themselves behind someone stronger than they are. That's what David does all in this one verse. You see, 1 Samuel 26 is the last time Saul and David ever see one another. The commentators put it this way. Saul and David are done with each other after 1 Samuel 26. They are completely done with one another. They will never see one another again for the rest of their mortal lives. They will never again look at one another face to face. 1 Samuel 26 is the last time after 15 years of David and Saul having their relationship a relationship between king and child, a relationship between God's formerly anointed and God's presently anointed, a relationship between a disgraced ruler and a soon and approaching ruler filled with grace. After 15 years in 1 Samuel 26, they will never see one another again. The scholars put it this way, they are done with each other. Of anything they could be with each other, it will not work anymore. Don't you know all relationships can't work forever? Amen. All partnerships don't last forever. Some people are Lionel Richie, others are Commodores. <laughs> all right. Make it plain. Make it plain. Can you name a Commodore that is not Lionel Richie, James Ingram, or, or Peebo Bryson? Because those are the only three I can name. There's nothing wrong with being a Commodore. I love Night Shift. That's one of my favorite singles, but I know more Lionel Richie songs. There comes a point in which all partnerships do not last forever. Somebody is going to become Eddie Kendricks in the group. Somebody's going to go solo. Saul and David are done with one another. David is now telling Saul, it's time for me to drop my solo LP. We're done with one another. David now in chapter 26 matures into the man that we will know. In chapter 26, he becomes the man that we will admire. If someone were to ask me, how do I understand David? I would say, read only three chapters. Chapter 24, chapter 25, chapter 26. Don't read a single psalm. Don't read about Goliath. Don't read about Bathsheba. Read chapter 24, chapter 25, chapter 26. That's the whole story of David as a man. In chapter 24, he spared Saul's life and he cut off a piece of Saul's cloak. That means that he cut off part of Saul's covering. The first thing David does is he removes the covering from Saul. Chapter 25, he gets married. He has some children. He acquires some property. Now he's a husband and a father. Chapter 26, he spares Saul's life a second time, but he takes two things from Saul. His spear, or the chani in Hebrew, meaning the javelin of power and his water jug. The javelin represents power. The water jug represents life. David has cut away his covering. David has taken his power. David has taken away his life. All while becoming a husband and a father. David has grown now. And if we were to look at verse 20, David is up on a mountain. Saul is on the ground. David is holding Saul's javelin and holding his water jug. Saul has no javelin and has no water. David has 600 men with him on a mountain. Saul has 3,000 men with him on the ground. God has now created a distance between good and evil. Saul can no longer get to David anymore. Saul can't do anything to him anymore. Saul will not even see David again after that day. Saul now realizes that the Lord has made a decision between the two of them. And so even Saul finally comes to his senses. 
He confesses to David that he must now accept that David is the king. Saul says to David, I have done wrong. I am sorry. Come back, my son, David, for I will never harm you again because my life was precious in your sight today. I have been a fool. I have made a great mistake. David replied to Saul, the Bible says, here is your spear, O king. Let one of your young men come over and get it. David is saying to Saul, he won't even give him back his power. He's saying, you send someone to come get this. He's saying, now I'm up here. I'm no longer coming down to your level. The levels have changed. And then David professes and proclaims. He prophesies to Saul. He says, the Lord will reward everyone for his righteousness. The Lord will reward everyone for their faithfulness. And the Lord gave you into my hand, but I would not raise my hand against the Lord's anointed. Your life was precious in my sight today. May my life be precious in the sight of the Lord. David does not care whether or not his life is precious in Saul's sight. He says, may my life be precious in the sight of the Lord. He's saying, Saul, I don't care what you think about me anymore. I only care what the Lord thinks about me. You come and take back your javelin. Come and take back your water jug. Tell him, come take your stuff. David is saying, my mind is now on the 12 tribes of Israel. My mind is on taking over the city of Yakebus and turning it into the city of Jerusalem. David is saying, my mind is on Reuben and Naphtali. My mind is on Issachar and Dan. My mind is on Levi and Benjamin. My mind is on Ephraim and Manasseh. My mind is on Judah and uniting all 12 tribes. My mind is on taking over Moab. My mind is on taking over Ammon. My mind is on taking over Philistia. My mind is on taking over Edom. My mind is on taking over King Adadazer and taking Geshur from him. My mind is on taking over Tyre and Sidon. My mind is over taking over everything up to what is now modern day Iran. My mind is on taking over everything from the foot of Mount Sinai up north to what is now modern day Syria. My mind is on taking over everything that expands as far east as modern day Iraq. David is saying, my mind is on bigger things, Saul. Take your stuff back and leave. David is now saying, God has made me king. And then... Saul says to David, blessed be you, my son. You will do many great things and you will succeed. But before that, David shames Saul. He says to him, the king of Israel hunts me like a single flea or a partridge in the mountains. He's saying, Saul, you are king. You should have been ruling this whole time. And you found time to come after a single flea? Take note. Five chapters from now, David will get a crown. And this chapter ends by saying, David went his way and Saul returned to his place. Notice the Bible says, David went his way. Saul returned to his place. The word for way there is the word lacardo, which means journey and path and destiny. And the word for place there is lemkomo, which means area. Saul went back to his area. Saul went back to his corner. David is going to fulfill his destiny. David is on his way. Saul was just getting in his way. David has somewhere to go. Saul is going back home. David has a kingdom to go rule. Saul now must go back and do what he's supposed to do and stay put. The Bible says David went on his way. Saul went back to his place. And there's a message in that, especially for young people. Don't let anyone get in your way. Just be on your way. Don't let anyone get in your way. When God gives you an idea for something, don't let anyone get in your way. God has given you a business that no one else has. Don't let anyone get in your way. God has given you a dream and a vision that no one else has. Don't let anyone get in your way. There will always be a Saul. There will always be those who come after you wanting to stop that dream. And I know today is not Youth Sunday, but as long as young people are walking the earth, every Sunday that I'm here is going to be Youth Sunday. Young people, don't let anyone get in your way. 
Don't let anyone stop you from doing what God has given you to do. Don't let anyone get in your way. I want you to remember your pastor said, don't let anyone get in your way. Don't let the devil get in your way. Don't let Satan get in your way. Don't even let anyone in your household get in your way. Don't let classmates get in your way. Don't let a teacher discouraging you get in your way. Don't let people who don't know your relationship with God get in your way. Don't let anyone get in your way. I don't know what's waiting for you on Monday, but I want you to remember Pastor Grimes said, Pastor Grimes said for me not to let anybody get in my way. I'm telling you, the Lord does not want anyone to get in your way. You be on your way because the world needs you. You know, by the year 2050, 60% of the world will be below the age of 18. By the world 2050, 60% of all human beings on earth will be below the age of 18. So I'm talking to the grandparents of those who will be grandparents of those who cover 60% of the world. Don't let anyone get in your way so that way you can create a world that's worth living in for your grandchildren. Amen. For those children yet unborn so that they won't have to grow up in a world of malice and murder. So they won't have to grow up in a world of greed and theft. So they won't have to grow up in a world of domestic violence. So they won't have to grow up in a world of destruction. Don't let anyone get in your way. David is no longer going to let Saul get in his way. Right. He has something to do. And so David burrows himself like a flea. He refers to himself as a single flea. He has burrowed himself inside of God's will. David now is focused on one thing, uniting all 12 tribes and creating one Israel. That was the point of the whole book. One Israel. 12 tribes is one. One capital, one temple, one people worshiping one God in spirit and truth. Now he is about God's work. But the thing about a flea is this. If a group of them bite you, you'll hit yourself and scratch. If one of them gets inside of you, you'll never feel it. And a flea can live inside of a human being for 10 days and live off of your blood. It lives off of blood because blood has iron, potassium, oxygen, nitrogen, nutrients. Inside of blood, you have neurotransmitters, dopamine, adrenaline, endorphins, serotonin. Fleas live off of that. In an evil world, we must barrel ourselves into the body of Christ and live off of his blood. Because his blood has righteousness, holiness, grace, forgiveness, protection, and strength. We must barrel ourselves up in his body and he will keep us safe in an evil world. Finally, church, hide yourself like a partridge. Hide yourself behind a partridge. David said, you hunt me like a single flea or a partridge in the mountains. Here's the thing. Partridges are normally in trees. They only go into the mountains once they have younglings to protect their younglings. There's another song you might have heard. It has lyrics that says 12 drummers drumming, 11 pipers piping. Ten lords a-leaping, nine ladies dancing, eight maids a-milking, seven swans a-swimming, six geese a-laying, five golden rings, four calling birds, three French hens, two turtle doves, and a... Partridge. We know that song. But did you know this about a partridge? More so than any other bird more so than an eagle or a hawk, more so than a condor or a wild turkey. The partridge is the most protective bird in all of creation over its younglings. It is so protective that when it has younglings, it will build the nest up in a mountain instead of in a tree because a partridge is notorious if necessary for stretching out its wings and flying head first into any other animal or human or threat to its younglings. It will give its life in order to keep its children safe. It's not random that when we finally get to that first day of Christmas, that it's all about the partridge in the pear tree because it's all about the one who got nailed to a tree, stretched out in order to protect his children. In other words, hide underneath the power of Jesus because he's strong enough to protect us from the evil of this world. Burrow yourself up inside of him like a flea. Hide yourself behind him because he's our partridge. He's the one who stretches out and protects us from all evil. Oh, there's another song I remember. 
I can't sing, but I think the lyrics say, I'm going to hide behind the mountain. Oh, I'm going to hide behind the mountain. I'm going to hide behind the mountain where the chilly wind don't blow. Because Jesus is the mountain. Jesus is the mountain. Jesus is the mountain where the chilly wind don't blow. I'm going to leave you now. But not without telling you uh, about my two dogs. I used to have two dogs. I love those dogs more than I love life itself. They're with the Lord now. Somebody's probably saying, Pastor, I didn't know dogs go to heaven. My dogs did because it ain't going to be heaven if my dogs ain't there. So my dogs went to heaven. I rescued them both from two different shelters. I love those dogs. I had a collie. She looked kind of like Lassie. Her name was Bella. And then I had a St. Bernard. And I named him Bar Kokhba. That's a Hebrew name. You know, I was going to throw some Hebrew in there somewhere. And every day, Bella and Bar Kokhba would play in the backyard. Now, Bella um, had not yet undergone a certain procedure that would make her less active in the morning. Um, so she, she liked to get um, active rather early. And I remember telling Bar Kokhba on many mornings, I said, boy, you better enjoy that. That's a problem a lot of men would love to have. And what would happen is I could not walk them both at the same time um, because Bella was very active. Um, she liked to run around and she liked to explore. Um, Bar Kokhba being a St. Bernard and being a larger dog, he was um, a bit more still. But if he ever felt that there was a threat, then you could hear him go, hur, hur, and you know, he would kind of back down the threats. But Bar Kokhba was more of a still kind of um, stoic type, but Bella was active. And I couldn't walk them both at the same time because Bella would want to pull me in one direction and then Bar Kokhba would just want to still and look in the other and just stay still. So I would have to walk them separately. Now, when I would walk Bella, Bella really walked me. She would pull me to the right, pull me to the left, back to the right. I'd be in people's flower beds. I'd be in their front yard, backyard, and everywhere else. I almost needed a, to put a saddle on Bella in order to try to just to, to break her a little bit because she would run everywhere. She'd be on the walking track, jump in the swimming pool, go to the playground. She would explore everything. And she would wear me out. And by the time I would get back to my, my home and take her backyard and in the backyard and put in the fence, then I would walk Bar Kokhba. Bar Kokhba was different. He would leave the gate and then he would sit down and then he would look around and start smelling. And what he would do is then go everywhere where Bella had gone. He would follow her exact steps and would sniff everywhere that she had gone in the same exact pattern. This is one story, but you can take it three ways. Some of us are the finders. Others are the followers. But you need both. God calls some of us to go out and explore and to break new ground and do things. But then you've got to have somebody who can follow up behind that and do the same thing and reinforce it. But another way you can take this story is whenever we're trying to come up with our own way to live our life, we really shouldn't do that. You see, God already gave us something. All we need to do is just follow behind it and wherever it tells us to go. We just pick up the scent of God's word and just go from place to place wherever God's word will send us. And then we will end up where we're supposed to be. But then there's one more way to take this story. One morning I woke up and went to my backyard as I always did, looking for Bella and Bar Kokhba playing around. And I noticed that Bella was frantic running around the backyard. Bar Kokhba was gone. I checked the fence. I don't know how he got out. I'm, I'm frantic, I'm running around, and she's running around, frantic for various reasons, because it was morning time, and she had a routine. She's running around. So I say he couldn't have gotten far because he would never run fast. 
So I go out in the front yard and I look down the block and I look down the street. I don't know at what point he got out, didn't know where he had gone. I'm worried. A day goes by and I'm thinking at some point, as many dogs do, they'll come home eventually. But a day goes by, even at nighttime, I'm opening up the door, I'm looking out for him, I don't see him. Two days go by, I still couldn't find him. Now I'm very worried. I'm wondering if he's hurt, if he's been hit, if something's happened to him. By this point, Bella is just barking day and night and howling and everything else. I knew that Bar Coke would love spare ribs. So I went and got some ribs. And I put extra sauce on the ribs and tied a rope around the ribs and started driving around the neighborhood with the ribs hanging out of the window <laughs> saying, Bar Coke, come home. You should have seen my neighbor saying, Reverend Grimes has finally gone crazy. I knew it was going to happen. <laughs> I heard my neighbor saying, child, did y'all see Reverend Grimes had spare ribs hanging out the window, <laughs> talking Hebrew, and he finally done going off the deep end. Lord have mercy, help him, Lord Jesus. The boy's just lost his mind. I was riding up and down every street with those ribs hanging out of my window, just saying, Bar Coke, but I got ribs for you. Come home. I'll admit, I cried about that second day because I wanted my dog back. Then I thought, I said, Bella, Normally, it's the one who goes out first. She normally goes out and, and blazes the trail. She normally goes out and sets the pattern. But I started thinking, she is a finder. She does know his scent. I opened up the gate. I put the leash on her. I said, Bella, I'm just going to go wherever you take me. Bella knew the neighborhood. Bella knew the terrain. She took me down the street once, and we made a quick left. Then we made a quick right. Then she took me into a yard over a great big pile of pine straw. We started going deep into the pine straw. Bar Kokba was brown. I would have never been able to see him behind all the pine straw. But she started digging through the pine straw, and there he was, curled up, asleep. In less than two minutes, she was able to get right to him. And Bar Kokba probably was trying to find his way home. But he wasn't used to being out on his own. He didn't know his way on his own. Do you know why I love Christmas, saints? I love Christmas time. You see, you didn't drive yourself to church right now. You didn't make your own way to church right now. I don't want anyone to think that you woke up this morning and you made the decision to come to 801 East Glenwood Dyer Road. You, you didn't make that decision. You didn't make that decision on your own. I didn't make that decision on my own. I didn't make that decision to go down the aisle just on my own. Not back in 1989 when I went down the aisle. I just didn't do that on my own. See, I was lost. I'm not the only one. Somebody, matter of fact, all of us at some point, we were lost. We were in some places we should not have been. We were in some things we should not have been in. Doing some things we should not have been doing. With some thoughts we ought not have been thinking. Saying some things we shouldn't have been saying. We were lost. Couldn't get back home on our own. We were lost. As a matter of fact, we were lost since the garden. We were lost since Adam and Eve. We were lost back then. We weren't listening back then. But then what God the Father did was he said, Moses, take these spare ribs. I want you to drive around the neighborhood with these ribs. I want you to hold out these ribs and see if they come back. And then God the Father said, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, take these ribs, drive around the neighborhood, see if you can find them. And then finally he said, I'll build a temple. Took up some ribs in the temple, get the aroma of the ribs. Maybe they'll come back. But that didn't work. We were still lost, right. still lost in sin, right. still confused, still trapped in a world of evil, yeah. still not knowing which way to go, yeah. still not knowing how to get back, right. still not knowing which way was out, still not knowing which way was up, yeah. still not knowing how we would get through. Yeah. Yeah. But then God the Father said, son, you know this neighborhood, don't you? Come on. Come on now. And the son said to the father, dad, I know the terrain. Right. I know the neighborhood. Yeah. I know Galilee. 
I know Capernaum. I know Decapolis. I know Judea and Syria. I know Samaria. I know the neighborhood. I know the tears that they cried. I know the depression they felt. I know the mourning they go through. I know the hurt they experience. I know what it is to bleed. I know what it is to go through things. I know what it is to suffer. Father, don't you worry. I will go get them and I will bring them back. And when I bring them back, I will give strength to those who struggle. When I bring them back, I'll make a warrior out of a weakling. When I bring them back, I will make able the unable. When I bring them back, I will give triumph to those who had tragedy. When I bring them back, I will bless them. I will heal them. I will strengthen them. I will uplift them. I will glorify them. That they will be glorified with me. I will tell them, if you abide in me and my word abides in you, then ask whatever you will and it shall be done for you. Jesus said, by this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. Jesus said, whatever you want, you ask for whatever you need. If you need some help, he will help you. If you need some healing, he will heal you. If you need some strength, he will strengthen you. Whatever you need, however you need it, whenever you need it, in the morning, in the noon, in the evening, in the midnight, in the next day, in the next week. And if I'm telling the truth about it, then somebody say amen. amen. The door's open this morning.